So I realize today is Easter. I realize that we celebrate the Lord's uh, uh, resurrection every day. I hope you understand that, and I hope you realize that. And we do that because of Calvary, because of his death, burial, and resurrection. When the ladies go there, we sang the song a minute ago, he, he's, he, he arose, he's here, he's not here, he's risen, he, he lives. When the ladies say that, and the angels say that, and they confirm it, and, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he was seen of above 500, and all that uh, analytical evidence to need that he is who he says he is, and he, there he stands. He does it all with a purpose and a plan in mind. And that's what we've been looking at as we've moved here in Ephesians 1. We, were, we went all the way down through, and we've been taking an excursion off of verse number 19, about, and, and, and in verse 20, uh, about his power. Verse 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? So there's a power. By the way, in verse 17, 18, and 19, there are three things there that every mature Christian adult needs to know about. We need to know Him. We need to know the Father. By the way, we need to know Him, but we need to know the hope of His calling. Too often times we focus on our calling, you know, and, and us getting a new body and us going and being in the heavenly places. You know, you ask somebody, hey, how you doing? And you get the organ recital, you know. This hurts, that hurts, everything hurts. Well, we focus on that, but Paul says in this prayer here, what I pray for you, what the Holy Ghost through me prays for you, is that you would know Him and know the hope of His calling. What is the Father doing? Chapter, verse number 10 of chapter 1 tells you what the Father is doing. Verse number 9, he says, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. By the way, if He's making known the mystery of his will, then it's no longer, his will is no longer a what? A mystery. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? You can know it. Well, what is the mystery of the Father's will? According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that, here it is, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the Father has a two-pronged a, a two -pronged attack here. And, and Paul says, I pray that you will know him, know what his plan is, know the hope of his calling. What's he doing? What's he doing when he forms the body of Christ? What's he doing when he goes through and deals with the nation of Israel and, he, and they come out the true Israel of God? What's he doing all that for? Just to have something to do? You know, God didn't wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm bored, I think I'm going to make a little planet, third rock from the sun, and do some things over there. He had a plan, and, and that's what we've been talking about. Because when you know the hope of his calling, what he's doing, then you see in verse 18, what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance that he has in the saints, right? But everybody focuses on the inheritance in the saints, but that's really the hope of his calling, and you miss the second issue, which is that you would know the riches of his grace that you would understand how valuable you are to the Father and to His plan. That's fantastic. You see, we like to get down and go, oh man, look at what we're going to do. But He says, hey man, you're valuable to me. You're the one that I made accepted in the Beloved. Back up in verse 6. You're the one that I blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, verse 3. And He begins to go through them. I did all that because I want you to know how valuable you are to me. Too often times in our society, we get our value from our job, our family, our parents, our school that we graduated from, how well our ball team did, or not so well, <laughs> or what are they doing now? We see, we get our value, and, and the Father says, hang on a minute, <laughs> you're valuable to me. Because there's a program that I'm doing out there in the heavenly places, and I'm going to use you to fill that all up for me. And then he says, I need you to know about my power. So I put my power on display for you, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Boy, no, nobody else can ever say that they rose from the dead. Yesterday in the men's fellowship, we're talking about Muhammad and Islam. You know, Muhammad never rose from the dead. 
Buddha never rose from the dead. I saw on the news or a news show that they stuck a thing down in William Shakespeare's grave and it's empty. Well, how long has that dude been dead? Quite a few years. What happens after time with your body? Goes right back to what? To the dust. What do you? Why do you think it's empty? Oh, somebody stole. Somebody stole it. So now we're gonna have an investigative report. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. Hey, he, there's others. There's more logical explanations than somebody stealing it. What happened? They're dead. Christ says, nope, not me. God the Father says, you want to see my power on display? is when I brought him up from the grave. Not that he died and was buried, but that he what? Rose again. Now look at the next verse in verse nine, the next word in the verse 19. I wrought him in Christ when I raised him from the dead. What's the next verse? The next word. And. You see, there's a two-pronged picture here of the power that we're to know about the Father. One, we see it at the Calvary, but and he set him at his right hand far above. I'm sorry, he set him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, and that is in the, uh, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church for your benefit. He's the head over the all things. And we looked at those all things, that governmental structure out there in the heavenly places of the principalities and the powers and the mights, and you go to Colossians 1, verse 16, and you see thrones and dominions, and there's seven titles that are laid out in all of this as he takes that government and he sets it all up for his pleasure, Revelation 4 says. We'll get there in just a second. And we looked at that, and we saw that the heavenly places are, they're real. They're organized. Folks, you have to, I hope you understand that God is not a God of disorganization. He is not the God of confusion. He's a God of order, and he's a God of structure. And he puts the things in, and we're going to see here in a minute, we're going to go back into Job 38. I'm trying to tell you what we're doing and review at the same time. And he's going to lay some of this stuff out because that structure is important. Principality, power, might, and dominion. Every name that's named, you go to chapter 6 and you see rulers are brought up in verse 12. Colossians 1, you got thrones and dominions. And you've got those seven structures and every name that's named, by the way, is the bottom group. That's the rank and file. That's everybody else. Because what does it take to get into the body of Christ? Hello? <laughs> Faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? The fact that he raised Christ from the dead, the faith in the cro finished cross work, the co finished complete cross work of Christ. Once you believe that, you're where? By one spirit are you baptized into one body, aren't we? And the mechanics of that spiritual baptism, that identification into the body of Christ. Now, whether you come to understand right division or not, that's on you. The fact is, though, that when the trumpets blow and the shout happens and the those that are alive in Christ and, and that are dead in Christ all meet the Lord in the air. That is, salvation gets you there. Now your job out there on the other side of the judgment seat of Christ is going to be based upon your knowledge of the truth. And when you, that's 1 Corinthians 3. And when you go through all that, boy, I'm glad the air conditioner came on. It's warm up here. I'm reminded of anyway, I can't. And the thing of it is, is the goal in all of this is verse 10, is to bring all that back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the heavens are real, they're organized. But right now they're under satanic control. There was a rebellion in heaven. And Satan is loosed up there and he's in control. And a couple weeks ago we looked though that God has a reconciliation program for the heavens. And that's where you and I come in. And that's, over, again, over in Colossians 1, verse number 20. By the cross, he's going to reconcile all that back up to himself. And the all things are always talking about government and structure and organization. And when we come here, and when verse 10, I'm, I'm just looking for verse 10, I'm in chapter 2, I don't Verse 10 of chapter 1, when that is accomplished... 
when you begin to understand what the Father is doing through the Son with you and I, and that He would have you know about Him and to know about His plan and His purpose and His power and His calling, and you get to know the Father, you know what begins to happen? That begins to motivate you. Because what you begin to see is is that God has the big picture covered, doesn't He? And He's got everything. He's doing it all according to His Word, and everything is set the way He's going to want it to be set one day. What that does is that then allows me, it allows you to trust Him, to trust His Word then in the small details of life. Because, man, when you know he's got the big done, then what do you know? Then he can get the little stuff done, too. We looked last week at the end there, and you can flip over there with me to um, 2 Corinthians 4. Because the things that you and I are doing right now in the day-to-day life, this is where we develop the skills for the heavenly places. Now, David said he's 60. If you're just coming to understand this stuff at 60 and later in life, you know what? Get excited and enjoy the last 20 years of your life in this. <laughs> and if you're young and you're just catching it and you're getting into it, man, you got a whole life in front of you. Man, catch it and enjoy it and live in this. Because when you understand what's going on with you and I today in this big plan of, of God, and what he's doing out there in the heavenly places with you and I as the body of Christ, and and you come to understand that the stuff that we go through now and deal with now develops the skills for the heavenly places, you know what begins to happen? This stuff now doesn't seem so perilous and overwhelming. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 7, verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. Boy, ain't that the facts. That's a fact right there, isn't it? My daughter looks at me and says, Dad, you're getting a little white in the beard. I'm like, white? So I'm looking, I'm thinking about that Grecian formula, you know, diet down. And I'm like, that ain't going to happen because it ain't going to match the rest of it, you know. Because my luck, it'll be red, you know. <laughs> and I look at that and I'm going, man. But you know what happens? You, you wake up one morning and things don't want to work. What's going on? The outward man is what? Perishing. You're gonna, folks, it's a fact that you're going to get sick and old and die. What you worried about? That's the facts. The suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared, Romans 8, 18, with the glory that shall be what? Revealed in us. Boy, if you can catch that concept that you're going to get old. I, I, I saw a little thing about the vegans, you know, people who eat the vegan diet, you know what happens? They still get old and they still die. I was like, you know, that's a, you're just now getting it over there. I see. That's an interesting point because you know what? It's true, isn't it? I don't know. Think about it. For our light afflicts, oh, I'm sorry, yet the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. Folks, when you die, if, you, if, the, if the Lord tarries and you pass away before the Lord comes back, what's going to heaven? Have you ever thought about that about you? Well, chapter 5, verse number 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <laughs> Where are we going? Down in verse 8, he says, Absent from the body and you're what? Present with the Lord. We're confident about that, aren't we? Man, you pass in, you go right to heaven. You know what you don't do? You, now, you don't get your new body yet, because when you get your new body in the rapture event, the trump of God sounds and you're resurrected into the new body, that's the signal it's time to go to work. You're on R&R till that time. Follow that? You're on vacation in San Diego on the beach at 70 degrees. Okay? Or you're surfing, or you're up in the mountains camping, or wherever you like to be in your mind on vacation. Okay? I mean, it's in the fourth turn of PIR, right? Right down to the NASCAR race, okay? But see, the thing is, is what do we know? The inward man is renewed day by day. What do we know? When you die and you go to heaven, everybody says, you don't take anything with you, do you? 
That's not exactly accurate. Because what do you take with you? Your spirit, your soul, your inner man, you. So then what should we be doing? Well, I'm way off rabbit trail. Mine not even end on notes, okay? What are you doing? It's Resurrection Sunday, right? <laughs> what are you doing? You should be renewing the inner man. You should be taking the word and putting it in your inner man so that when you go, guess what's going to happen? You take more of the skills to work and to do. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. What's that next word? Worketh. Wait a second. You mean, yeah, that's what I mean. It works for you when you have what? The renewed mind, the renewed thinking process about the light affliction. Is the outward man going to perish? Yes. So then what would the renewed mind be about the outward man? It's going to what? It's going to perish. So I'm down at LA Fitness, working it out at 20 bucks, 25 bucks a month, and I'm sitting there going, a fool and his money is soon parted, because <laughs> it's going to perish. And then my doctor says, why did you stop? And she, you know, then my wife is on me, and I'm like, I should have never stopped. You know? you know, Mama's not happy, nobody's happy, right? So now we're sitting over here doing it. But the thing is, is when you have a renewed mind about it, When stuff begins to hurt and the light affliction does come, you don't get overwhelmed with it. Because what is it working for you? When you apply the renewed mind to the situation and to the issue, it's going to work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you apply the renewed mind to what's going on here, It's going to work for you. It's going to develop in you a skill that's going to have an impact in glory. That's great. That's fantastic. You get that around your mind. Paul says in Romans 12 about be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's when you attack and when you look at things through the renewed mind. While we look not, verse 18, at things which are seen, but at things which are what? Not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Hey, I tell you what, every one of you can have your, be all up in a river about the political situation in this country, and you know what's going to happen? Next week it'll be just different. It's temporal. It moves. It changes. And it's changing for the worse, no matter who's in the office. But how do we know that? We know that from a renewed mind of understanding what the political schemes of sinful men are going to eventually end in. So we get all worked up, you know, Trump this and Cruz that, and Hillary, oh my gosh, you know. And, you know, I know the father's going, what are you guys, nut jobs down there? Didn't you read? I'm going to take care of this. I got a plan for you. It's out there in the heavenly places. And I got a, I got a pleasure, my pleasure I'm going to do, and I'm going to use you, and I need you to develop skills to work out there. And how do we develop those skills? We come to the Word of God rightly divided. We study it. You know, it's interesting. You get into a work, and they look at you and they say, if you go back to school and get a degree, we'll give you a better pay raise or whatever, right? What do they want you to go back and do? They want you to learn something, don't they? They want you to develop a skill, set that then they can go over here and use, and you can use. God says, I gave you the best textbook ever to walk and be on planet Earth, and I want you to study it. Now, if you're in the math class, do you study English and math? Now, you might do math homework or English homework in math, but when you're in math, you're studying math, aren't you? And A plus B equals C. And Y minus Z is F. You know, how, how did numbers and letters get mixed up? I don't never know. But they do. But the thing is, is what are you studying? You're studying according to how you're being taught, aren't you? And when you're taught a certain way, so God says, I want you to study, and I'm going to teach you the way to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're not right, dividing truth from error. You're taking truth and you're, putting it in the right positions and places. Now, why? Because 
the Father says, I want you to know me. And how do we know God? How do we know God the Father? The only way to know, the only way for you to get to know me is for me to open my mouth and tell you something about me. You're that way. You see your spouse across the hall or across the room. I heard a great line last night. I'm going to have to, I can't use it because it was in a movie. But anyway, <laughs> Linda rolls her eyes because she knows what I'm talking about. But see, the thing is, uh, now you want to know, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, come on. Yeah, no, the, this, this lady walks across the room to the key, role, the key uh, male actor, and she says, I've been watching you from across the room. And he says, well, why don't you go back over there and keep watching? I'm like, ooh, yeah, ooh, 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 that's a good one. <laughs> oh, man. The thing is, is I forgot where I was headed, so that's a good thing, right? <laughs> get, get Revelation 4. Get Revelation 4. The point is, folks, is God says, oh, I know what it was. We're, we, he says, I want you to know me. How do I know the Father? I have to come to where he has revealed himself. And where has he revealed himself? In his word. So when I come to his word to know him, and he says, I got a prescribed way for you to come to know me through right division and placing things where they belong and don't try to be somebody you're not. Then he says, now, Ephesians 1, we're in Revelation 4, stay there, but in Ephesians 1, I got this whole cosmic plan for you guys, the body of Christ. Revelation 4, John is hauled up into the throne room of the Father. And the sealed book is going to be laid out here to be open. And the question is raised, who's worthy to open the sealed book? And the only one is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. By the way, which is a great thing to understand, that he was slain where? Before the foundation of the world. He had the plan was already made, and he knew the plan, and he was doing the plan. In verse number 9, Revelation 4, verse number 9. He says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. We're up, again, we're up in the third heaven. We're up in the heavens. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that, that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns and uh, before the throne saying, now when they cast their crowns, crowns are, are an identification way of, of authority. There's only 24 of them. Deuteronomy says that the earth will be divided amongst the number of the nation of Israel. That's 12. Well, Hebrews says that what the earth is doing is mirroring what's up in the heavens. And there's a pattern in the heavens that's being taken care of in the earth. So if there's 12 on the earth, what's up in the heaven? 12 in the heavens, those 12 sections and so forth. So then these guys are laying at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's worthy, the authority of the universe. And, he's, and they say to him in verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive. Notice that, to receive. Hebrews chapter number 1 goes in and tells you why he is worthy to receive the inheritance. Because he went and died at Calvary. That's why. He did the plan completely. We call that the faith of the Son of God. Receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. Now watch. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Colossians 1, he says, they were created by him and for him. Why? What were they created? For thy pleasure. Look at that. Man, if what pleases the Lord. You know, Proverbs says there's seven things that God hates. You know, then it gives, all right, I know what he hates, but what's pleasing to him? By the will of the Father, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Boy, what pleases God? What's his good pleasure? That out there in the heavenly, out there in the ages to come, out there in the dispensation of the fullness of times, out there when in Acts 3 he says the times of refreshing and the times of, of restitution take place, that all of it is back under his headship. He did all that for his pleasure. That's fantastic. You and I can know it. You and I can enjoy that. Come back with me to Job 38. When he did creation, 
when he created the universe, he didn't just say, well, I think we'll put Orion's belt there, and I think we'll do this there, and I over here, and yeah, we'll go way down there, but he didn't just willy-nilly toss it out there. He had a plan. He had a structure. By the way, in Acts 3, there, verse 18, 19, 20, 21, and you think about it, he, he calls it the times of refreshing. What do you do when your computer, when it's giving you that death spiral? You pull out the 45 and put a hole in it is what you do, right? No, what do you do? You refresh it, don't you? When the website goes down or, or I hear about it and I go in, I always refresh my browser. Why? Because it's stuck in that old, in the cache and all that stuff. And Okay, what are you doing? You're going back to original starting place. The time of restitution going to restore it all back to Genesis 1-1. That's what we're doing. In Job 38, God is going to talk to Job here. This is where we're at, <laughs> trying to get to, okay, <laughs> this morning. i got 15 minutes with you. Job 38. I mentioned last week about Job 38, so I thought we'd look at it this morning. Understand that the Father has a plan, and he's got a plan for you and I to participate in the government of the heavenlies, and he says right now on time you need to develop some skill. And those skills are going to translate out there and be worthy and be that counted of that glory. And you need to be aware of that. One of those skills is the skill of understanding. You need to understand this. Job 38.1, God's going to talk to Job now. And he says, Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by the words without knowledge? Boy, Job's got three miserable friends that have words without knowledge. It's interesting in 2 Timothy 2, 15 we use, but ver verse 14 says that you should not be about words of no profit, words without knowledge, words that aren't going to benefit the hearer. Interesting. Gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, by the way, when he says there about gird up your loins and stand here like a man, he's not talking about toughen it up and stand here, you know, and take this. He's talking to Job about, Job, think about why I created man. Why did I create man? Have you ever thought about that? Who is man, Psalm says, that thou would consider and look at? Have you... Think about why in the world did he even create man? So Job, pay attention here. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, notice the terminology, the terms used here. Where was thou when thou laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Well, where was Job? He wasn't there, was he? Okay. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations there, thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? You see the construction terminology? What's he doing in the universe when he's creating things? He's constructing some stuff. And he's constructing, Psalm says, a place that he can come and dwell with man in. And there's construction going on. Now he's going to describe, verse 16, what he created. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in search of the depth? Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Hast thou perceived the breath of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Look at what he did there. Gates, doors, a place where the shadow of death is residing. By the way, there's a door right there, right? A door would sit on what? On a building, wouldn't it? On a house. There's, there's a gate and there's doors. There's a place, there's a location. Verse 19, where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof that thou shouldest take to it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof? See the bounds? you got a fence. 
you got a house where darkness lives. Now, darkness is an interesting character in the Bible. John 1 says, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we're not talking about the lights being turned out in a room and there's no visible light. We're talking about a what? A spiritual darkness. Abraham is put into a deep sleep and he sees a seed off. And, it, and in Genesis, he calls it a great horror of darkness as he sees them down in Egypt. Colossians 1, we're going to go there here in just a second. He talks about how you and I have been translated from the darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're talking about a spiritual darkness. There's a place to it. There's a path that leads to it. There's a highway. There's a fence around it. There's a way where light resides. Now you think about light. I mean, think about that. Where, so it's not light as in the physical light, is it? And God said, let there be light. That was a day before he ever hung any stars or sun or moon in the sky. What kind of light? If you listen to oh, Dr. Stanley this morning, he said, Hi, don't hide your light under a bushel. And that's not the light he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual light. See, there's some things going on here. By the way, folks, we looked at Daniel 10. Gabriel comes to Daniel to give him the vision information about the vision. And he says, hey, I was coming 21 days it took me to get here because the king of Persia withstood me. Well, he's coming through the heavens. So what is there through the heavens? There are pathways. There are gates. There's doors. There's houses. There's palaces. There's places. Now, when God created and he built all that, he didn't just go, where does it fall? He says, no, I've got this, I've got that, I'm putting here, I'm putting there, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, because there's going to be a battle. Look at verse 22. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? When I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. Whoa, don't you remember in Revelation about some hail coming down and hitting the earth? There it is. It's already sitting there. He's waiting for the general in charge, the highest ranking authority to say to the universe, it's time to go to war. Where are we talking about? Second coming, over here. Revelation 12, the war in heaven, where you and I are instituted and placed into the heavenly places. We looked at last time, where he cleans out the heaven. Remember, we looked at Numbers 33 when he told Israel, you go into the land, you dispossess the enemy, and then you take up residence. What's he going to do? And by the way, if you don't take up the residence, what's the guy going to do? You're going to move right back in, Luke said. So what does he say to him? Look, I've cleaned out the heavens, and all ye that dwell in the heavens, there we are, Revelation 12, 12. He set us up. But what I want you to see is back here in creation, when he's doing this for his pleasure, he says, I got it all planned. I love verse 31. Because everybody goes, oh, you can't study the zodiac. That's satanic. But yet, look. Have you, canst thou bind the sweet influence of Pallades? Or loose the bands of Orion? Those are constellations, folks. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? That's the zodiac. Now, Satan, Job 15, 15, says the heavens are not clean in my sight. Satan's polluted all that, okay? So you can't go out there and do, and do your horoscope. By the way, my horoscope changes every week. You know that? It's amazing. And it's never good. It's like, really? <laughs> I like something good, you know? But it's not talking about that. What rules? Have you ever thought about what really rules the earth? The sun or the moon? What, what rules the earth? The moon. And when you think about Israel's timing and Israel's time schedule, it is always lunier. The Gentiles worship the sun god. They always, it's, it's 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., it's all that, always that way. Verse 33, here is, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Ordinances, order, things that hold it all together. Job 26, he calls it the pillars of heaven. 
Folks, creation, when God, when God created creation, he did so to where he would set up his armory ahead of the coming battle. Come over with me to Luke 8. Luke chapter 8. And by the way, if you were with us in Sunday school, I just found my other note page. Because <laughs> we were talking this morning, I couldn't find my note page. But I just found it. So we're going to look at Luke 8, just real quick. I got about eight minutes with you. When God created creation, and he sets up the, the creation, he knows the adversary is coming. There's no the. Oh, man, he just showed up. What happened? Yeah, he's, a God. he's God. <laughs> and by the way, Satan, Lucifer, is an anointed cherub. He's a created being. He's a cherub. By the way, next week we're going to look at the creatures that now occupy the heavenly places, the unicorns and the sardis and the fire-breathing dragons and all these little dudes that inhabit these positions of authority right now. In Revelation back there, he called them beasts. In Revelation 4, these beasts. Luke 8, verse 1, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout uh, throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Now drop down to verse 22. So we're, the subject matter of Luke 8 is the kingdom of God, preaching and showing. The Lord's out there demonstrating that he is the Messiah. Luke, uh, verse 22, And it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched therefore. They come up to the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to move to the other side. Verse 26, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarene, which is over against Galilee. Now, if you just draw a circle, they're down here in the south east corner. They're going to go to the northwest corner of the Gadarenes. Gadarenes, the city of the country of the Gadarenes are here. Galilee is here. Okay, now this is going to be very important in what we're going to look at in the next five minutes. Because in the Gadarenes, this is the territory in Judges 17 and 18 where you see the first introduction of Baal worship into, the, into Israel's history with Micah and Dan and the house of my gods and calling a father, calling a priest dude father and all that stuff, Judges 7. It all happens in that territory. That is the first place in Scripture where Satan gets a foothold into the land of Israel. And in Israel's history, and by the way, right after Judges 17 and 18, you have Ahab and old Jezebel who married Ethba, her daddy was Ethbaal, B-A-A. -A. So who's coming in? Who, who's getting introduced? Baal worship, idolatry. As the official religion in Israel, this is where we're at. Now what the Lord's going to do is he's going to go up there, and we have the maniac of Gadara, we call him, right? And he's, he's got legion, and he's got all this, uh, verse 27, and, he, and, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Man, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they say, man, when you see this going on in Israel, it's because they're completely left God. They've completely left the, the word of God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're over in Baal worship completely. So where are they? Over there. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? Now, isn't that an interesting title that he called him? Because in Genesis, um, over there, Genesis 14, the, the Most High God is defined as possessor of heaven and earth. This dude, full of the devils, the demons here, you know what he says? You are, you are the Son of God. You are the Son of the possessor of heaven and earth. You're the one. He didn't have to sit there and go, who are you? <laughs> you know, like the guy in Acts. I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? <laughs> he doesn't have to do that. He identifies him. Now, what's going to happen, verse 30, and Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered in him. You go over to Mark 5, you get some more detail. Jesus looks at this guy. Now, remember where he's at. He's up in the territory where Satan has a stronghold. 
He goes in, and he's going to kick them out, dispossess the demons from the guy. Do you remember what they ask him? Don't kick, kick, put us in the pigs. Don't kick us out of the land. That's Mark 5. Now, he doesn't say that here, but they said, don't put us out of the land. You know why those demons know what? They know something, don't they? They know their job is to, is to possess and inhabit the land. And they're like, don't, don't kick us out of the land. So the Lord puts them in the pigs, and the pigs run over and jump in the water. Okay? When we studied Luke 8, we spent like five, six weeks just looking at this stuff about devils and demons and all that. What is he doing? What is the Lord doing? He's dispossessing, isn't he? The land of the satanic policy of evil. He comes in. He puts them in the pig. They run over. It's not pigs. It's swine. Excuse me. Don't be politically correct. Okay? He puts them in the swine. By the way, the swine an un, is an unclean animal in Israel. So he put an unclean spirit in an unclean swine. And you know they never object. So they must felt right at home. <laughs> All right. You work on that one. Strike two. But then he goes and runs them over, and they run over into the deep. Now, it's interesting because the deep, the first time you see the deep in Scripture is Genesis 1, verse number 2. And, and that's after the issue of judgment. For without, the earth is without form and void, and the Spirit moves upon the waters of the deep. And all of that's going on. So the second coming is going to liberate the land, kick Satan out, and he's going to put in his people, the nation of Israel. You got that? All right? Now, I said all that to say Colossians 1. Go there. Because you, I, I told you, when it comes to how God's going to work, we see the pictures in Israel's program. We see in Numbers 33 when he tells them, you dispossess the land, and this is how you do it, and then you enter the land. Because if you don't, they're going to just come right back. Right? We're, okay? Well, if he's going to do that with Israel... He's going to do what with the heavens? Same thing. Just different people are involved. Look at Colossians 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Look at what he's done for you and I. He made us meet, qualified. How does he make you and I qualified to have the uh, to obtain the inheritance? That's verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Calvary, and the fact that you and I have been to Calvary, trusted Calvary, and he says, okay, because of who you are in my son, this is what I have done for you. Now watch verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Well, that's an interesting thing because we saw darkness in Job. There's a house, a, a shadow of death and gates and doors and all this stuff. And he's delivered us from the what? The power, the authority. He has delivered us. He, he has destroyed the authority of Satan to run your life. It's done. It's gone. Boy, let that sink in for a minute. What ought to come to mind, by the way, just so to help you out, is Romans 6. The old man has been crucified. You've been set free. Don't be a servant to sin. Be a servant to righteousness. You've learned the doctrine. You've heard it's time to move on. Don't move back. He's translated, he delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You know who? He took away the authority of Satan to run your life and he put the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to run your life. He replaced them. And the reality of your current citizenship is not the great U.S. of A., but the reality of your current citizenship Citizenship is in the heavenly places, and that is how God the Father looks at you, and that is how God the Son looks at you, and it's how God the Spirit looks at you, that you are citizens of the heavenly. Now, I know right now we're stuck here, but one day what's going to happen? There's going to be a shout, there's going to be a voice, and there's going to be a trump. 
And we're all moving up to the east side. Actually, the north side, okay? All right? And we're moving to the north. And we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And at that meeting, the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord's going to look at you, and he's going to say, okay, Paul says it, 1 Corinthians 3, what would you do on the building? I laid the foundation. How would you build on that foundation? Let's put it through the test. The fire isn't heat lamp in the Greek. The fire is the word of God. What would you do in obedience to the word of God? Well, I got my religious background because everybody does. And you know what Paul says? That's fine. That's wood, hay, and stubble, and it's going to be burned away. You won't worry about it. Well, I got my wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. That's gold, silver, and precious stones. And Paul says that's the good stuff because that's going to be left standing. And when you come out on the other side of the judgment seat of Christ, the skill level that you've developed on the earth is identified, and they says, okay, here's what they can do in service in the kingdom of God, of heaven. Then the Lord says, man, if I didn't think I'd ever get you guys done, but I finally got my body done. So now, 1 Thessalonians 3, he goes and presents us to the Father. And the Father says, well done, my son. Not many mighty, not many noble, but man, they're all looking good today. They're without, Ephesians 5, they're without blemish and spot. And he says, okay, if you have this certification number, let's just say A, your job is going to be this, based upon that skill level, and you're going to function in the government of the heaven right there. And then he's, the Father is going to spend time with, with you and I. That's the inheritance of his saints. And he's going to place us according to our ability of service in that governmental structure. Now, that ability of service... And by the way, 2 Thessalonians 1 says suffering as well. Okay? Yea, all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. If you're living as who you are in Christ, you're going to suffer. How, how, how'd you do? None of this impacts your salvation. None of this impacts your justification, I'll be clear. But all of this impacts your glorification. He says, now you guys are here. And he begins to lay out. Because you know what's going to happen? There's going to be one guy that just got saved before the rapture. You know? Now, by the way, that's not what triggers the rapture. He just, he got lucky. And he said, I do, to Calvary. That guy hasn't had any time to build any understanding, truth, knowledge, doctrine, has he? He's in every name that's named. He's in the rank and file. And you know what? He's not going to sit there and say, I wish I had 35 years to learn. He's going to say, hot dog, I made it. Woo, look at this. This is fantastic. Glorious freedom. Marvelous freedom. Look at this. And he's going to be happy being down there shoveling horse back in stuff out in the stables. They have horses, you know. So, Okay. He's going to enjoy it. He's going to be right in it. And then you and I are going to be... Now, while all that's going on, you know what's happened? The Lord has slipped into the heavens, and the war is taking place between Michael and the dragon. And the, and the Lord is bathing his sword in heaven. Cast Satan, the dragon, down to the earth. We then fill in. A cleaned-out heaven. A heaven dispossessed of all the creatures, and the new creature is placed in. And Isaiah 34, he says that he takes the heavens and he rolls it like a scroll, and he shakes it. And it, the shaking is like a leaf falling off a tree or a fig off a... It's dead. You know what he does? Satan's got all these rank and authority out there, and the Father says, that ain't what I want done, dude. <laughs> Beep, beep, beep. print, there it is. That's what I want. Done. And we say, ta-da, here we are. And in Ephesians 2, verse number 7, we put display that wonderful wisdom, the riches of His grace, the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us. We put that on display for the ages, plural, to come. 
It's the dispensation of the fullness of times, plurality. We put it all on display. And creation then looks and says, wow, look at the wisdom of God as they see the display as we're there. So he goes in and he's going to clean them up. And it all starts, go back to Ephesians 1, last verse I promise. I shouldn't promise, but I promise. It all starts because we are to know the power, the exceeding great power of God the Father, which he wrought when he did what? Raise Christ from the dead. I've told you over and over and over and over again, Calvary is more going on at Calvary than just your sins being forgiven and paid for. The resurrection, Romans 4, he was raised for our justification. Paid in full, it's a done deal. But then he says also because of that, look at everything else we're now doing. And what you and I need to be doing right now is we need to be developing the skills to work out there in the heavenly places. How do we do that? Come to the word of God the way God would have you come, rightly divided. Get into the epistles, Romans of Philemon, of the, of the Apostle Paul. Study that stuff out. Get that into your soul. Well, then what about the rest of the Bible? Have you noticed today we've been in Revelation, Luke, Daniel, Job? You've got to have it all. Paul says it's all there for our learning and admonition. It's there, folks. But we look at it properly, understanding. what's, And then we take that and we renew our mind. And with the renewed mind, now we go and deal with the issues of life. Because the renewed mind says, hey, dummy, he took care of the big. He can also take care of the little. You just got to trust him. And you got to let him. I told you one more pattern. No, I'm just kidding. Okay? Now, next week, we'll look at some of the creatures. And they're kind of interesting. Because you've read them. You've gone, huh? What is that? We'll kind of take a look at them, all right? Know what's going on, folks. Resurrection, Easter, one day a week, one day a year doesn't do it. It's every day. He's risen. He's not here. He's alive. From up from the grave, he arose. Produced glorious freedom. Wonderful. That word emancipator, boy, what a great word. He set you free. I hope you're here today and you understand that. I hope you're here today and you believe that he set you free. And if you don't, it's a simple, the simplicity that's in Christ, Paul called. And that's that he died for your sin. You could never do it yourself. You could never even think about doing it for yourself. And he says, I did. And because he did, all you have to do is simply trust him. And when you trust him, he says, okay, you've passed from death to life. You were over here, you were an alien you're an alienated from me, you didn't have my life, you had nothing, I had nothing good to say about you, and now I have all this wonderful to say about you. You're low down, dirty, rotten, so and so, and now you're the saint of the most high God. And then get in the book and find out what that means. Too often times today and I'm preaching again, so you, you get the feel. You get my point. And if you're here today and you know you're in Christ, you know where you're going. Let's get in the book and let's start developing the skills to develop for the future. It's good to have now and now, but you need for that future because it works for a far more way to glory. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the freedom that we have in it, and the freedom that we have in who we are in your Son. And I pray, Lord, as we just go day by day, that we would remind ourselves of who we are in your Son. We'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In your name we pray.